Okay, so without ado, welcome everybody to the session. My name is Brian Ricks. I am co-owner uh, and founder of Brycom Computers, um, an IT infrastructure company. The other co-founder technically is my wife because she told me so. She's the true owner, and this Monday was her birthday, so I was here instead of home with her, so that's not good. And then Saturday is my mother's birthday, and so I'm flying home Friday because I'm not having both women in my life mad at me. So with that, I am going to ask you all to do me a favor, and in this room, I'm going to record as everybody says happy birthday for me, okay? You don't need to say anything but just happy birthday, but that's... I'm already in a, a doghouse. I don't need two or three of them. So with that, if we can get everyone to say happy birthday on three. One, two, three. Happy birthday! Uh, that's why both of them, that would be both. Um, mom, that's the mom. And then my wife is Julissa. So awesome. That, thank you. OK. We started off good, yay! Interaction with the clients. Okay, so we are here to talk about Skype room systems as a concept, as well as um, the different kind of variations within those systems and, and in the ecosystem. This is a 45 minute session, so I already speak fast, and I do apologize up front. I've also lost my voice since being here. <laughs> The way it goes. So I am going to um, do my best to get the content out we need and leave time for questions. However, if at the end we do run out of time and it goes to the wire, we can always come by the booth. I'll be there at least by two this afternoon um, up until the end of the day. So if you have questions specific to this or anything Skype related, feel free to come on by. Okay. So we're going to start with a history of Skype, room systems. It's funny because when we talk about the history of the systems, we're talking, oh, three years. It's not that long of a, of a lifespan of how things have come. And when we talk about LRS, which was our first iteration of the, the room systems and as a solution, as we can say, that solution was back in 2013. So it was, it's not that old of a system. There's, there's still systems being put in that are LRS now uniquely coined Skype room systems, but we'll get to that confusion a little later. Then the Surface Hub that we saw last year at Ignite, and people that are lucky enough to have them and have ordered them and then they arrived, congratulations, but that is a back order on those. Those are coming out. Those are still a great solution that we'll get into a little bit later. And then this new Project Rigel, which was announced, which, just to keep things sanely insane, they're called Skype room systems, again, not to confuse with the whole ecosystem or to confuse with the LRS or the link room system. So in this presentation, I'm going to refer to the new system as Project Rigel, if for no other reason, so I don't confuse myself because it's, it's confusing. So the, the main differentiator we see along the ecosystem of these is that it is somewhat evolved and somewhat not in the sense of who and what is making these systems, right? So at the very beginning with the link room systems, we had Smart, we had Crestron, and we had some potential others, but those were the two main manufacturers. Polycom took some stuff and evolved some of the systems as well, running the same concepts, same ideas. Um, the, it's, it was a few manufacturers that were brought to market to bring a specific solution to market. With the Surface Hub, Microsoft makes the hardware. So much like conceptually a Surface and the name Surface, right? The Surface brand, that is a Microsoft brand, and that hardware is designed and developed and branded with Microsoft. With Project Rigel, it's all partner-based. It's all going to, today, Logitech, Polycom, Crestron, but there will potentially be additional partners that can jump on the same boat. Similar, the, the, the easiest way to compare it is the Link Phone Edition, right? So Microsoft comes up with the spec, comes up with the software, other manufacturers make the physical hardware and you get the different look and feel, and we'll get into that as well. But that's how we've evolved, or moved, if, if it's not an evolution, it's at least a transfer of data that we're going through. Okay, so from SRS. Quickly, from a, again, a historical, we have the Skype room systems. Its purpose, its focus, and that's really important as we go through these three different systems, is they're all different focus-based, and we include SRS or Skype room systems because um, it's still a valid option if, in fact, this is what we need, right? This is the, the solution that's competing with our big full room systems, something that's going to compete with 
a Cisco telepresence type solution. It's, it's a very, I don't want to say niche market, but it is a smaller market of those that want to and can afford dedicated rooms to dedicated systems that are dedicatedly set to just this particular purpose. But when they need them, they need a great system, and that's where the Skype room systems came in. We had the single display, dual display, they can be mounted on the wall, they can be on the floor, they can move around as needed to within the room. Much more unique and, and differentiating than the telepresence, and at a, a third or less cost, right? The price point was just phenomenally different and thus where they came to play. That's the market. Moving that onto the Surface Hub. From a Surface Hub perspective, it was a brand new design, a brand new category of information, of, of possibilities and how we interact. It was all about bringing people together, an immersion experience where we got, got up on the whiteboards. And how long and how many companies have done just that? In fact, how many people have either ordered or have Surface Hubs in the room? By a show of hands, okay. A lot, right? It's, it's, it's a completely different experience than what we're expecting from a traditional teleconference room. Now, what about of those same people, well, actually, let's do it all again. How many have smart boards or other interactive boards within their companies? Right, just about everybody. So the point being that this is a direct replacement for some of this technology, but more so, it, it enhances the technology. Everything about the smart board was about bringing you together, and everything about the the hub is even more so because we have the audio, the video, the interaction, the ability to share, play, talk to friends. And you can say what you want, and probably it's all positive, I'm sure, but you can say what you want about the, the Surface Hub, but it is a fun machine. If you get up and start texting and playing, it's responsive, it's amazing hardware, it's best of class hardware, and that, that is its design, and its price point comes at a, at a premium for that particular reason, right? Two sizes, 55, 84, and the, and the pricing being significantly less than SRS, which is LRS, but at the same time, it's not something that we just willy-nilly go throw around. So to me, when we see the collaboration devices like a, a, a Surface Hub going in, it's the wow factor. It's the one when you open up your front desk and you come into the, the, the office, right, your main greeting area, your lobby area, and you have this glass conference room, there's this big 84-inch TV just shining through, it's awesome. It, it's the woo, uh, it's the CEO that says, I want that, and there's just one in his office that, that maybe uses, but he's got it and it's a talking point, and that's an important, important piece of what it is. Then we get the new Project Rigel. So we have this variance of where we have these fairly expensive machines to still expensive but less expensive machines that are wow factors. And now we get to the, the, this new concept of, well, that's great, we've, we've given the wow, we've given the people the ability to give full rooms, but what about everybody else? And how do we bring the price point down to make it so that it can actually be something we can do? And with that comes the Project Rigel, right? With a small, point of, of interest, a small point of entry into the market. We're able to put one of these in small rooms, medium-sized rooms, potentially large rooms, depending on the, the equipment that's hooked up. It becomes more of the ability to create your solution versus being handed a solution. Uh, the, really, the big key concept of this device is it's, well, what the old coined phrase that Microsoft had was VoIP as you are, right? Way back in the OCS days, it was the use RCC, keep your voice. We don't want to play with that. We did. But we don't want to play with that. VoIP as you are. Well, now this is coming back and saying, hey, let's video conference as you are. Let's reuse some of this equipment. Specifically, and almost always will be your whatever projection or television display device that you have in these rooms. All of a sudden, the argument of getting a Surface Hub of, I've already got a, a really expensive 70-inch TV. I don't want to go buy an 84-inch and plop it in there. Um, what do I do with the old TV? Well, now we have a solution for that. And we can make this room a Skype room system simply. And it's using stuff that we all know and know how to manage, know how to maintain, and are very familiar with. So we're going to kind of forget about LRS. <laughs> we're going to let Skype room system as the LRS big boy kind of slide away, and we're going to talk now more about the, the hub and the new SRS or Project Rigel, right? We're going to decide, at this point, we're focusing on what the masses can and do afford, and, and the assumption being that those that have the large link room systems have them and or will have them, and that's just what that is. But this is going to be focused on managing and provisioning for the two new systems, which are very, very similar, which is nice for us. So. 
one of the things we want to do is try to differentiate what are these two platforms. Because while from a marketing position, and we've gone through at a very high level from a marketing what their value prop is, from a technology position, there's a lot of things that are similar, but there's a lot of things that are different, and that impacts you when you're an IT admin and somebody that's maintaining these devices. So specifically, we get the team collaboration, we get that. That's what the hub's about. We get that the Rigel's about the meeting. We're just taking the meeting experience and making it better, easier. But what can we do within these devices? Again, if we're talking about the Skype meeting experience, we're talking about voice video collaboration. We're talking about document sharing. We're talking about participating in the meeting, but we're not talking about the interaction collaboration part of the hub. So those are your differentiations when we're looking at what's available. It can make calls, they both can, can do the video, they can both do what we need to do from a utilization perspective of having a meeting. But what happens in that meeting, how that meeting actually gets the content is slightly different. We also have a very huge difference in what operating system they live on. And you say huge, they both say Windows 10. Yeah, okay. Well, they're also, to put it in line, both of these applications come from the same um, core structure foundation of code as well, right? They're different branches of, of Skype, so technically they're the same as well, both say it was Windows Team, Windows 10. Windows Team, for those that are not aware, because I definitely was not as much, um, is a stripped down, compartmentalized version of Windows uh, that allows you to have features that you need and features that you don't need um, kind of ad hocly removed when you get it. So think of it as a building block set and somebody says, GUI, nope, don't need that. Networking, yep, put that stack in and put that block on. Do, do I need any security? Yep, throw the firewall on. And they've just massively dismantled the operating system from a, what you would use it for and turned it into an appliance. That's great from an appliance perspective that can add challenges when we're trying to do management of these devices. So that's a big differentiator. As well as when we buy a Surface Hub, the Hub comes with its mics, it comes with its speakers, it comes with its cameras, well, and that's that, right? It's an appliance. You hang it on the wall or sit it on the stand and, and it just works. It's a simple device to, to just um, utilize. From the Project Rigel experience, the vendors that we are, you're OEMing these from do have the ability to make packages, and they are packaging up various um, solutions so that you get your camera, your speakerphone, uh, everything but the monitor. You get all of that as one package, but again, you don't have to, because if you already have things in your room, then we can go ahead and take these same devices and hook them up to, up to Project Rigel, which is where the difference comes into play from a peripherals perspective. Everything is up to you to make it work from a bring it, you know, it's a BYOB world, it's a bring your own device world, it's a bring your own, all we're, we're bring your own stuff. So this is exactly what Rigel is doing for us. It's allowing us to bring our own, which is a good thing, because the things that we're bringing, hopefully, are Link certified devices or Skype certified devices, which mean we know the work. So the question comes over at the booth over and over, well, what if it's not? Well, what if it's not? Well, well, our recommendation is you use Link or Skype certified devices. If they are not Link or, or, or Skype certified, then they're not certified. And that's where that lies. But it's a Windows 10 enterprise device. So if you plug that camera into your Windows 10 computer at your office and it lights up and sees it as a, as a uh, capture device, guess what? We're gonna be able to see it as a capture device just as well because it's Windows 10 is what we're driving on. It's, it's infrastructure and it's DLL architecture and all of its functionality is fully present in the current version of the Project Rigel. Okay, so we have difference in OS. We have a semantics on does it run UW, UWP or modern Windows apps. So if you've played with the Surface Hub, you know you hit the little window button, it pops up, Word, it pops up, Excel pops up, Maps pops up, we have the store. Okay, so that's all, yes, the Surface Hub rubs those. The application that you are interacting with on the Project Rigel device is a UWP app. So does it run it? Yes. Does Windows Enterprise 10 run these applications? Yes, because we know that there's a store app on our enterprise operating system. So semantics. We don't, uh, we don't present within the application the ability to pop up and run apps because again, that's not what we're doing. We're not interacting per se with the, the actual device. We're projecting and, and becoming an inclusive experience within the device. 
Okay, we also have a differentiator around the support model. So with the new Project Rigel, 2015 and online is the only supported versions that have been tested and work with the current version, right? Whereas the Surface Hub is 2013 and beyond. So that can be a differentiator. And then again, as we talked, the partners make the Project Rigel, Microsoft makes the actual hub. Okay, so now we've got through the what is the what, and now we're gonna talk through the actual provisioning process. Now there are very hard line specifics in making these things work from a user account perspective. The irony being, these very hard line requirements are nothing special, and again, that's on purpose. The idea is not to reinvent, reinvent the wheel, but rather to create something that we're used to. We're used to making, well, okay, back this up. How many people in here use Microsoft Exchange for their email system, whether online or on-prem? And for the past 10 years, has it been the same? Everybody, it's, it's, this is not something who doesn't use Exchange. And if you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll laugh in the corner, but it, it's okay. Exchange and the concept of a conference room and conference room booking back in 2000, 2003, there were Mickey Mouse ways we did things. There were third-party add-ins. Microsoft has evolved it to the process of where it's an actually integrated solution within Microsoft Exchange, right? So we can create a room, and when we book this room, it automatically has properties. We can set sizes, people that can be in it. Then when Outlook schedules this room, it recognizes it as a room and auto sets it as a resource. All of this kind of auto management exists in the back end, back end in Exchange. So we don't need to reinvent that wheel, right? Scheduling is not something that the Skype team is looking to create. They leverage the Exchange side of that. From Skype, we know how to make a Skype user. We know how you can log in with a Skype client and you can do audio, video, get instant messaging, things work. So there's no reinvention there. Those may not know that there are requirements of, uh, requirements is the wrong word. There, when we create a room within Microsoft Exchange, it's a disabled user account. So a user gets created, gets disabled, and now we can book that room. That's great from licensing, that's great from everything that goes along with it. That's not so great for Skype. Skype needs to log in, it has to have an actual account, it has to have a physical um, password to get into this. Unlike a com common area phone or something that's just a contact object, we're talking about a real user because it has an exchange account. So there's a, there, are, there are requirements between the two where we kind of mirror them and make those two work. So from a permissions perspective, we have to have things set up correctly in not only our directory, whether that's online or on-prem, we have actual exchange that has its permissions because we're gonna be give, given rights to accept and auto reject meetings as the case may be, and Skype has to be a user that can get in, right? We have to have a mailbox, it has to be Skype enabled, so it has to be enabled so we can get onto it. It should have PSTN, um, even if it's just your rooms that are using PSTN and you're tying it in and you're not leveraging the entire enterprise voice solution, which would be a shame on you. This is right where the, we're going, we're trying to get everything into a, into a common feeling and, and usability. But if you do, you get PSTN and it's a conference room. If you don't, you could still technically use it, you just wouldn't have PSTN. So, and then the versioning, which we already went through. From a licensing perspective, okay, preface, I am not a licensing advisor. I do not make decisions on what you pay for or what you don't pay for. Every EA can be unique. Everybody pays different, maybe, but not. I don't know, I'm not gonna claim. But I do know that within the Office 365 portal, there are three things that we need to have for full functionality. How you get those three things and what license models you pick and get them to be, that's up to you, right? So, E1 is going to give you the ability to have a mailbox and enable a Skype user. Do we need applications? No. Right, we're running a customized code on both the Hub and on Project Rigel, so the, the, the actual client is not something that you're purchasing. Okay, so we need the E1. Cloud PBX. We have to be able to do PSTN if we want the full experience, and hence PSTN. We need to be able to have a phone number we can associate to the physical conference room. So those three things, in whatever way you get those together, that's going to be required. Does that mean that there will be a cost for every room you have if you have to associate what you didn't have associated before to a room? Yeah, probably so, because in the Office 365 world, it's, it's, it's black and white, right? We associate a license and it's taken out of our, 
our, our pool. It's not something that we can physically decide, uh, hey, Microsoft, I'm not really using it, so don't charge me. It, it's, in order for it to light up and work and provision, we have to associate a license. On premise, I will leave that up to you and your discussion with whomever you're working with um, through your, your licensing process um, of is it a real user and am I physically logging into it? It's more like a shared mailbox, therefore we'll just leave it as we have to have a user account, we have to provision it with an Exchange mailbox, and we have to provision it with Skype. Okay? For Exchange, it has to be a room resource. And you say, well, Technically, a room resource is a user mailbox now because we just enabled it. Why don't I just leave it as a user? When we go and install the various pieces, and we're, we're running through this walk and it's asking for your login and password, it will fail and tell you this is not correct if you haven't set up the users correctly. And it's looking for a physical room. So it has a flag within its attributes that says I'm a room resource and therefore we can get in. Without it, it's not going to work. Again, it has to be enabled, it has to be licensed. And if you're a Surface Hub, one of our other big differentiators is Surface Hubs use EAS to communicate with Exchange. So it's a big cell phone, right? You've got an 84 inch cell phone on the wall. It's talking back to Exchange as if it was a mobile device. That means if I have company policy that my global policy within Exchange is everybody has a four digit PIN, six digit PIN, complex password then that would apply to your Surface Hub and you'd have to unlock it. Well, we wouldn't even allow it to work, but that's the logic behind why that's not allowed. So more than likely, you will have a, a policy you've created, an EAS policy that is specific to the Surface Hub. That's the recommendation. So that there's a clear delineation between this policy is used for the Surface Hubs versus the others. Rigel uses EWS, so that limitation um, is removed. It's, it's a non-issue. We, we just, you know, go through a different route to access the Exchange server. But on the Service Hub, you will need to correctly create and associate, unless you don't use any policies today, a specific policy of EAS, okay? So that, that's a huge thing, and again, it'll, it'll blow up during the install of the Service Hub if in fact that is not true. Optionally, and when Microsoft says optionally, it's you should, but do what you want, right? The, optionally, we want to set some of these other parameters. We want to say, hey, auto accept the conference room, add the organizer to the subject, don't do that, just because it clutters up the way that the display on the, it's really about the look, feel, and the prettiness of the hub. Don't mess with the look, right? We want that nice, clean look, show the, the actual meeting that we're going into. Um, you can keep the, the subject, that's fine, because we're gonna show it, and then, the little nice additional response, right? That's the feature where when I book the room, when the email comes back and says, I accepted, there'll be a little text in that says, hey, thanks for booking me, or you've booked this particular room, or whatever the case you want to put out from the, the tech network, um, uh, I guess example, they have this as a surface room. Kind of like a, I know I called the surface room, but just so you know this is a surface room, I'm sending you an email to tell you this is a surface room. So you can do whatever you want, but the ideal, Configuration is that it's set up within your standards and, and you can match it and make it work the way you want. But they're optional, you don't have to do these particular things. On the Skype room, some people may know, may not know, that there is a requirement um, or there's a feature mailbox type, how about that, an object type called a meeting room within Skype. Link room systems utilized it and, and that's where we started to see it back in 2013. This particular enable CS meeting room is a PowerShell command. Uh, a lot of things are PowerShell anymore. A lot of the stuff in Office 365 are all done via PowerShell that we're doing here because there's no, no exposure within a GUI to do so. But we need to enable the user as a meeting room. And then we need to go ahead and grant that meeting room uh, enterprise voice, again, if we want the full functionality. If there are particular policies that we want to grant, those would be applicable at this time too. It's all about creating a, a SIP user as a meeting room, and then this object is done. Now, we go through this, and ironically, this is 90% this is of the battle from a provisioning perspective. Next point is there's an out-of-the-box experience where you just hit next, type the information in, next, 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 and it's set up and you're done. Because you've already set up who this box is and, and how it's working, right? So it's a very simple experience, assuming it's all done, and more important, you really want to get this done prior to trying to get through this because there is an option, and I don't know why there's an option, but there's an option to say skip this for now. Don't log into Skype, it's okay. 
Or you get to the exchange part and it blows up and says, ah, I can't figure out where your auto discover is. And so, yeah, forget about it. Just skip that. I don't need that. And then you boot up to your screen and it says, can't, can't get my calendar retrieval, can't log into Skype, and you have a big box that does nothing. So we don't want that. If it says it can't do something, something is wrong in your environment and it needs to be addressed. Simple things like auto discovery isn't working. If you have a fully functional environment, this, this should not be a problem. Right? If everything is functional, mobility works, things are working the way one would expect from the desktop end user today, then it's going to work. If it doesn't, you need to stop and look and see why. What's going on? Um, it should be fair, something fairly simplistic, but you know. What in IT is simplistic? If it was easy, nobody would be here, so there's that. So, there's a lot of different things we need to do, and so what we have done as a team is decided it would be really, really nice if there was just some little application or, or program or PowerShell script that just did everything for us. That would be cool. So, that's what we're doing. There is a single script. There were some requirements that were put together. We decided we want a script, whether it be for Surface Hub or whether it be for the new project Rigel, either way, that starts down a process, asks us for specific information. What is the name of the room? What is the information that we're looking for? Uh, what is your pool that you want to create it on? Which, what, you, what from a Office 365, which licenses are we going to apply to this user? All of that information is gathered within these scripts and then it's processed and gone, right? So we have a single script to figure it out. We had to be able to say, it works whether you're in the cloud, it works if you're on premise, it works if you're in the cloud and on premise hybrid, and if we get to the point where we can have Exchange on premise and Skype in the cloud, the transverse, that works. So that's four various scenarios in all one script and it's just all happy and logical and works. So that's all what this script is doing. Um, and it also allows us to have the delegation. A lot of large organizations, and even some small and medium size, will have Active Directory admins, Exchange admins, Skype admins, and they may be completely different groups, completely segmented um, users, and so this can be run as do everything, do part of it, do one of it, and you pass the script around to allow the various things. Everybody says, that's awesome. What if I have 5,000 of these Rigel devices? Because we know you're all gonna run out and buy 5,000 Rigel devices, which is good for you. If that's the case, it's a lot of next, 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 repeat. So we're looking at a bulk option as well so that we can take an Excel spreadsheet, CSV, you know, pump it in, just mass create these devices and then set it up. So we are one, two is done, three is in the works, and the full application will be soon available up on TechNet um, so you can just go and grab it and utilize it. You don't have to use it. Again, you can do anything manual that, that the script does, um, but this does it for you. Future releases will include stuff such as validating existing accounts, looking at information that you have in the environment so that we don't necessarily need to make stuff. We already go through from like an EAS as an example, pull up your list and say, here's all your EAS policies we see. These ones will work. Do you want to use one of these or create a new one? And kind of, so we're trying to do a lot of the, the guesswork and take it out so that it, this is a seamless experience and just create your user accounts. And again, that should be shortly. It would have been done, except there was this event called Ignite that just slowed everything down and, and that's where we are. So, um, yes? At the end, please. I, I, only because of these 45 minute sessions and, and yeah, there's just not a lot of time. So, we've got these devices, we've got them deployed. We're at this history now where it's in the room and we walk away going, good job. We have things. Training, I'm not gonna even address. We're assuming end users are intelligent and can figure these things out. And if not, we have training departments that will tell them how to use them. Um, all of that being done, how do we know they're still working? How do we know that they're actually provisioned and functioning the way we would expect them to work? Well, there's two different models here, and there's, so there's two different discussions, and the root of the differences is all because of the base operating system. Again, Windows Team is on the Service Hub, and Windows Enterprise is on the Rigel. So that's important because, again, Team takes things out and, and removes functionality, so not everything's going to function like it would on the Project Rigel. So today, when we want to start monitoring, the goal was Let's, let's allow people to be able to monitor the devices however they monitor their environment today. There is a caveat, and it, it's, it's 
Some say minutia, I say it's fairly significant because it's a difference in how we monitor, and that is, this is Windows Enterprise. This is not server edition. And a lot of enterprises, you have either segmented things off into either VLANs based off of the operating systems, or they are doing pools and polls and looking at the various attributes of their devices, such as server versus uh, opera desktop operating system, and this breaks that model because this isn't a user's box. This is an actual device that we're attempting to have up all the time and work 100% of the time. So we need to address that when we're looking at our model. It's, it's the same model we have, we just may need to tweak some things, and specifically for stuff like SCCM, where we have groupings and collections that have been brought in and bring in all devices that are servers, and then they're on a particular patch schedule, as an example. Well, this needs to kind of be included in that or may, maybe even made into its own group so that it's, it's not patched the way we would patch um, desktops on a monthly basis. It, that kind of adjustments that need to be made. But if we're using System Center, great, right? We're using SCOM to manage things. We're gonna have to go ahead and load the Windows 10 management pack, which we probably don't have today, and load that up so that we can monitor these Rigel devices. Um, if we're using some sort of quality dashboard, we're gonna get that, all of the updates and reports, because again, this is just an endpoint within Skype, right? This is just another device, like a mobile device, like a PC, like a Macintosh. This is just another user that's talking to our Skype system, so any of our QOE and CDR data, it's all going to the same place, so we can manage and quality and metrics and trace and follow where we're going, all like any other device. So that's easy enough to do. Let's say, we have some third-party applications that are monitoring our network. Just maybe even basic uptime. We're using PRTG for various um, volume of traffic, and we're looking at it from a networking perspective, or SolarWinds is doing some data gathering, or we're using the, the add-ins to SolarWinds that actually give us some deeper analytics. That's fine, use it. Again, this is just a device. We can load additional objects within this, right? So we, it is an operating system that we could can load agents if needed and required. We do want to test things. Anything non-Microsoft has not been tested, clearly stated. So, and even SCOM, if you were to turn everything on, as we all know, we will take everything down. That's the great mantra of SCOM. Turn it all on, take it all down. So we wanna make sure that we're doing things appropriately and we're monitoring what needs to be monitored. Um, there is no specific guidance reg regarding SCOM and how we would monitor it. It's more about what are you doing today and let's, let's do something logical uh, and go from there. But the, the key takeaway is what are you doing today? Keep doing it. They're, they're, we're not enforcing or doing anything because we want to make it a member of our domain. We can domain join this. It's a using, it's, it's, while it's a device, it's on our domain, therefore we have access, we have groups that are members of the administration, whether they are the domain admins, whether we have specific groups, anything can be added. You could have a Surface Hub specific group added. It really makes no difference, um, or Rigel specific group added. It makes no difference. Um, you don't have to join the domain. We will say we recommend you join the domain so that you have access and options and ways to get to the data and run reports and see things. Um, and that's really important when we get into the management side of things versus uh, monitoring. And group policies, they apply. So out of the box, it's Windows 10, firewall's on, join the domain, you have a policy that says turn it off, great, that's how you'll now get to the box easily and remotely, and you can deploy these without being there and just ship them out, because once they're joined to the domain, they're gonna take on whatever policies you have implemented. Uh, and again, we wanna think about that, because there's, there are potential negative impacts as well, which we'll get to, but that is something that we wanna look at. For management, it goes the exact same way. Are you using System Center today? Great, add it to System Center. Let it, let it start to collect its data, check out its patch levels. Uh, we wanna see where things are, we can push applications, we can push updates, we can do whatever we need, because again, it is a Windows 10 enterprise device. It's the, 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 the scariness of it kind of goes away because it's just a device that's like any other computer on our network. So, if you have Active Directory group policies that apply particular settings, that are corporate standards, great. There's some gotchas which we'll cover, but then use those, that's fine. What if we use Intune and we register all of our Windows 10 devices to Intune? Okay, go for it, do that if you want. Uh, with SUS can be done, anything that is a management of a Windows 10 machine today can be done. There's also OMS coming soon, so there will be the creation um, of a specific pack for the Project Rigel, there is today for Surface Hub, but irregardless, you can do what you need to do um, today. And again, 
we recommend joining it to a domain to make your life easier for that management purposes. Now, what if I don't want to? What if I say, you know what, these are more appliance-based and I don't want them on my domain? Okay, you can do that too. It's all about doing what you want to do to make it work in your environment. So remote PowerShell should be enabled on these devices. You can manually go into all of these while it auto defaults and runs in kiosk mode and comes up with this U universal Windows platform, UWP app, while it does auto run this application, you do have the option to escape out and go to the desktop if you're an administrator of the box. So you'll know the local domain or the local password of the local admin on that machine and you'll be able to get to it and you can do whatever you want at that point. So we're saying enable remote PowerShell. Ideally, from my perspective, I have a VM that I would create that's for management of these if I'm not gonna join them to the domain that have the same username and password as whatever the local administrator and password is because when we do a whack whack to a computer on a Windows network, if our user we're logged into matches the administrator of the box we're going to, it doesn't ask for credit, right? That's, it's gonna try that first and that goes through, so it'll use our administration. If we just have a, a virtual machine that's ready for us to get into that way. Um, and then we can launch PowerShell and just go from there, and it's very simplistic. And we've provided a couple, and we won't get into great detail, but to kind of show the stuff that we can get out. So, hey, is it up? Um, so I can run, you can, you can see where you can build a bunch of custom scripts where you can say, are all my devices up? Are all things running? When did they start? Are things going the way we wanted them to go? What about what devices are attached to my network? Can I see these physical things? What, what video devices, audio devices, display devices? A, a, a word of... Um, uh, learned experience, run this while it's working prior to when you're wanting to know if it's not working because it's hard to know what's not there if you don't know what was there before that's not there, right? So you kind of want to do a data collection of your inventory, know what audio devices are there so that when something isn't there and it's not present, um, it's really not present because it's just not in the list, you would know. But if you don't know, then you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? So that's how we look at various things. Getting the system information so we can track things. You can see this is the device that's on my network. Comes back, is it in a domain? Is it in a work group? What is it? Again, it's a Service Pro 4, we know that. And what's coming down of it? And then of course, just a basic system reboot. We can just, if we're on the same username and passwords and we can get things going, we can just do a restart computer and boot these devices if we're having problems remotely as well. The final one that we give up is there's this logs. So there is a PowerShell command deployed with these various devices that is local on the machine, because again, it's a Windows 10 box, right? And it is this collect logs.ps1. You can remotely invoke it. It will locally dump it, but it's gonna remote, we can remotely invoke this command and get this collection of data. It has a lot of data. And you may not want any of this data, but it's gonna give you a lot of data. It's gonna collect all your event logs. It's gonna collect anything that has anything to do with anything with your device. And so that can be a good thing, but there can be a lot of information you don't want as well. But that is there to, as a starting point, and it may be something you'll be needing to give Microsoft or your OEM or whomever you're working with to start collecting information. There's a, that command to go. And if they're domain joined, you, of course, you can run this command by logging in and RDP into the box and doing it yourself too. So um, that all works. From the Surface Hub, this is where we back up. So now, while yes, it's Windows 10, it's Windows 10 team. So from a, a monitoring perspective, what are you doing today? It's almost, uh, unless it's OMS, that's nice, because this is going to have restrictions that are in place that we can't play with, we can't change. It's an appliance of sorts, right? Uh, it's been locked down so that you can't get into things. There is no desktop, there is no PowerShell command, there is no command prompt to get to. There's no way to get to this box and into the inner workings of this machine, which means the firewall's on and you can't even turn it off. So there's no way to even do a ping up, is it dead or alive? This box is purposefully protected from everything so that the user experience is ideal. It's always working because you can't tinker with it, right? That's what the Surface Hub um, philosophy is. So we do have the ability to tie it into OMS, however, and for those that heard the great spiel of the OMS and collecting of logs and all of the differentiation of data, this is what that is. And there is a specific um, package that is out there specifically for Surface Hubs, and this is what we get from a monitoring perspective. So we can look into that. And we can gather, is the device up? Has it at least talked within the last hour? Are we having good quality video? Are we having problems? So I purposefully failed 
a, a mirror cast, and sure enough, I got a bad projection, right? The mirror cast failed. If I had one that succeeded, it would, it would show succeed, which it did. Um, are you having calendaring problems? It's kind of the get ahead of the game to just know are your service hubs working because there's not much you can do if, they're, um, if they are functioning incorrectly short of making sure they're set up correctly. They, they just work. Is the, that's the big value add of the service hub. They're just going to function like an appliance. But OMS will give us a, a dashboard into that information. And that's important um, for a lot of reasons, but we, we want to know are our machines working. And this is a great way to let us know are they at least up and are they functional. If they're up and they're running and calendar is syncing, they're working, right? What about management of them? Again, everything is locked down. Everything from quality of service and the ability to get into your registry and setting them, everything to turning off firewalls, everything to managing any and everything. So, what you do today was probably not what you would do with a service hub. Um, Intune, we can join them to Intune. So we have the ability to see some statistics on the devices that they're in Intune, and we can do minimal um, reactive behaviors, such as somebody walked out with my 84-inch service hub, wipe it, because it's a phone, yay, we can do that. You probably wouldn't, but you could. Or if you're having complete issues with it and you just want to reset and recycle the device, that could be done via your Intune. What about if I join it to AD? That is an option. And it's very limited what we can do. It's still recommended because we're managing and monitoring all of our objects within our, our directory. That's, that's a good idea. We can do Azure AD, we can do AD, we can do local, just like we can with Rigel. But when we put it in our AD, we can do things where disabling a computer account um, to prevent it to log in. If there's an issue, if something goes amok and we want to control the device on our network, we'll have some ability to do so, but it is extremely limited. So while we're saying it's limited, there's still value to it. So that's the point of that. Um, we can configure with SUS. That's a good thing, because that means we can control and, and create a specific um, policy for these devices so that they don't get any updates that we don't want them to, or they do get them, as the case may be. Um, they're only going to pull what's applicable to them. When you go to a SUS and he registers, he shows up as a Windows 10 computer. Uh, that, I mean, it, it looks like a Windows 10 computer to it, like anything else. So, we can register it and you say, well, if he doesn't accept group policies and I can't get to the registry, how would I do that? It's been exposed. So you'll notice here, there's a little button we push and when we do, we get that little pop-up that says configure with us server, right? I type in manually where to go, I hit apply, and now it says when we go back one page, because this whole look and feel of your advanced options is nothing more than the Windows 10 settings dialog box and it'll actually say some of these features are uh, set by your administrator, and you're like, I know, I just set them <laughs> locally. So, but the, it's, it's inheriting that kind of concept that it sees that was such a set. So that, that is how, and it's instant. As soon as I hit apply, it registers and it's done. So that takes that on. So that's how we can take from a management perspective of um, the OS. Will QoS be something that we can manage on this box? Someday, probably. If, if, if and when that happens, it will be through the, the settings options. It'll be somewhere we go in and we manually enter in the information that we want, and it'll be applying it to the operating system on our behalf. That would be my guess of how it would happen. How's that? So, what have we looked at and what do we know about today? And this is where the, we've, you know, the, the Rigel stuff is obviously new, but it's been in tap, and we've had some issues and some things that have gotchas, I guess, that we wanted to look at. So, the benefit of it being a Windows Enterprise device is that we can treat it, and it, just like any other device, it, it ingests group policies, it does things. The bad thing is that it ingests group policies and does things. So we need to think about these things, right? We're saying, hey, perhaps if I have an interactive lock on, I have to hit OK every time that I want to log into my computer because that's company policy. Perhaps I don't want that applied to my, my surfaces because that doesn't make any sense because I would have a big OK button that I'd have to go tap to just to be able to get it to log in. It would break the experience, the user experience. So interactive logons. Um, an OU specific to the Rigels is the recommendation. Throw, I mean, yeah, Rigels. Throw them all in there. Skype group systems, Rigels, ah. Throw them all in there and apply a policy by exception or by allow however it is that you manage your group policies today. Again, it's, it's nothing different than another computer. We're just saying change your settings. Make sure that things are disabled. In this case, we're showing uh, manage by exception. So uh, don't block inheritance, let everything come down, but then apply this specific setting that just turns off the features above it that were the ones that we don't want anymore, right? So we're, 
we're managing by exception here. So that breaks our auto login. And also, once we join the domain, that means whatever we were auto logging in with no longer auto logs in. So we'll have to edit the registry. The good old days, you know, go to the KB article and edit our registry to allow us to auto log in, provide our username, password, and get into the, the device. SCCM, same problem. What if we are managing all of our Windows devices and we put things to sleep at night uh, and then we try to wake them up? Well, we don't like to go to sleep. We're, we're a device that we go to low power mode, but we never actually go to sleep mode. It is Windows, so it will try to, and then things will break. So we want to make sure it's not enforced. We want to give it a specific policy, make it an exception to your Windows device policies. Break things out so that you're treating them like a server, even though it's a PC. That would, that's what we've seen. We need to make sure that antivirus is controlled and managed properly. Defender has been tested and supported, so locally if we use that, that is work. So do you have something else in the company? May work, may not work, may impact stuff. That's, the, nothing else has been tested. Same with software updates and things of that nature. QoS, the nice thing is QoS is simple to do and no different than if we were doing QoS on our, our PCs today. It's not a server, so we're not ingesting the server policies. So whatever, whatever D, DSCP settings we've set within Skype server on our back end, that's how we do it, right? We're gonna, it's gonna be a mirror of it. The variance is, oh, that is not the button. This is the variance. The, the application, if we're tagging by applications, the, the application name is microsoft.skypeteam.rigelapp.exe. And so we want to map it to that particular application, and then we'll be able to use our same ports and map things out and give the SCP. It's very simple, very easy to do, and it'll just inherit it on boot, because again, group policy, right? And then Windows Update. The store apps are store apps. We can turn those auto updates off, um, just like we can on the Rigel and on the Surface Hub. They are exposed on both. Uh, we can push them. If we have an enterprise store, we can manage our store updates, specifically the ones that we care about, on our Surface Hub and on our Rigel so that they're updated. We will see them patched. The application that you're actually running will be patched through the store. So patch management will be automatic. We let it be like a cell phone, right, and just let it happen automatically, or we can turn that off and check them periodically or push them through our own enterprise store that we've configured so that our devices don't use the public Microsoft store. Okay, and then we're gonna just get a couple of little troubleshooting things we've seen, and FYIs more than anything, and we're actually done to wrap up. So, when you first get the Rigel, because it's a Windows 10 device, and when they're shipped, they're shipped with whatever code is patched at that particular time, right? Well, that means that you're going to be behind on Windows updates. So expect to plug it in, and it's going to all just start booting a bunch of times because it's like, oh, I'm behind, and it's going to try to get itself up. Don't freak out. It's just updating and patching itself. When you're using your devices, make sure you're using the latest drivers and the latest updates because that's going to be something you're managing. Unlike the Surface Hub, which has static items, Microsoft can push drivers down for because it knows exactly what microphones you have, exactly what cameras you have. It does not know what you have when you're building your Rigel device. So you're going to need to manage that yourself. Um, HDMI audio will almost always take over your default speaker device, just the way HDMI works in Windows 10 today. So you very well may have to go into your desktop, check, right click on your speaker, playback devices, switch your primary to the actual device you want. It could be your HDMI audio, but if it's not, you'll need to manage that yourself. And then finally, make sure you turn your remote desktop on. Um, it works, and you can just get into the box. You can do things on these devices if it's remote, remote domain join, simple enough, and just do things, right? We can patch things, change things. There's no need to go physically touch these devices. Okay, so with that, we want to remind everybody that if you visit the booth, um, you will be able to enter yourself into a contest to actually win one of these devices from the Logitech. So you just need to go by the booth, take a picture, tweet it, hashtags, meeting accomplished, and in yourself into the drawing for that. No purchase necessary. Um, there are other sessions to look at. A lot of stuff coming up this afternoon and tomorrow. We have things as well. Finishing up with Bender, if you want to learn about stuff, that's awesome. He always goes nice deep and dive into the ice world, and this is even more so into, well, now with Office 365, what do we need? So there's a bunch of stuff still going on with regards to our world. Don't forget to join the Skype for Business community. It's how we're all coming together to help one another, because that's a great thing. And then we can deploy, fast track to get things going as needed. And the tech community is there as well, techcommunity.microsoft.com. And please fill out your evaluations. And that is it. So thank you very much.